The problem is sometimes when I run across media, especially on places like YouTube, TikTok, etc., it's very easy for nuance um, to be lost and also for us to forget that these are just personal opinions. Welcome back to the crypt. Today we are going to do a kind of reaction video. I'm using air quotes because here at The Crypt I don't really like reaction videos because I find that they uh, tend to either ride on someone's coattails, don't provide a lot of necessary information, are really just the excuse to rant about how much you dislike a person, which is not really my vibe on this channel. So instead, um, I wanted to do a video like this because a lot on my channel I've been talking about how um, things that are problematic within the community are really something that like we need change. Like what are we individually doing? Specifically me. <laughs> like what am I doing to change the things that I don't like within um, community spaces to make it better, not just for the younger people coming in, but also the people like me who are struggling within the communities. So specifically in the writing community, we have a lot of like comparing yourselves to others. One of the ways in which I have found myself comparing myself to others is things like processes and how we see the creative process. Um, now intellectually, I know that we're all different and we approach creativity very differently and I embrace that. In theory, um, the problem is sometimes when I run across media, especially on places like YouTube, TikTok, etc., it's very easy for nuance um, to be lost and also for us to forget that these are just personal opinions. And it's very easy to take this stuff a little too seriously and act like, oh, well, this person is saying that this is like gospel truth, but it's not. Um, I was raised very fundamentalist Christian and we very much had this like, because this is our held belief that God is real, everyone else is automatically wrong. Um, so we couldn't really hold multiple truths as true at the same time. There's only one truth and everything else was a lie. Um, but the reality is in the real world, uh, that that's not how it works. There actually are multiple truths at the same time. For example, you can think that uh, peppermint ice cream is like the best thing ever during the holidays and that's your truth and then someone else could be like, well actually chocolate fudge is like the best thing ever and both of you are right at the exact same time. Yeah, it's a personal held a belief and opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. I know I should be doing this and I do that a lot, but sometimes I still like watch a video on YouTube and have a knee-jerk reaction and I have to catch that. And recently that happened with uh, this video from Rachel um, that came out about a week ago, I think now. It's a very long video. Uh, I'm only gonna cover four things in here, but her whole video is almost 54 minutes long. It's very long. I watched it while doing chores and stuff. Um, but because I had some knee-jerk reactions and caught it, which I'm glad I caught it, but I caught some of the incorrect things in my head and I had to reframe them and I thought, you know, I might as well share that process of doing that on the internet, um, even though it's a little personal. Like, I feel like this is healthy to see, like, it's not just me talking about needing to change my perspective, it's like me actively doing it when I come across stuff that makes me uncomfortable. I'm only gonna focus on four. Rachel has 10 that she goes over in her video, so if you're curious about the things she it talks about in depth, um, please uh, click the link below. With all that said, um, let's all go ahead and, and get into this. Number one. Inspiration is collected, not created. Of all the many, many tools that I used over the course of writing State of Flux, of like the course and all the techniques and NaNoWriMo and like all these craft things, of all the tools that I learned and tried, I think this might be the one that changed things the most. This little book. Okay, so uh, collected, not created. Uh, this is very much just a difference in perspective, right? But this was the first knee jerk I had. Um, and my knee jerk was my first thought when I heard her say that, um, especially when she mentioned commonplace books and things like that um, a little later on, was my brain was like, no, that's not how it works. Which is dumb um, because it, uh, this is her personal experience with inspiration and everyone's personal experience with inspiration is valid. Like your experience with how inspiration works is 1 million percent true at the exact same time as someone else's because it's your personal experience. And I know that's a very no duh thing, 
but it's one of those things that I know that intellectually, but I still sometimes get that wait, like when I'm actually watching a video um, live and I have to catch that and be like, no, just because it's not your learn experience. Now a lot of these videos, sometimes they can kind of come off as like, this is the way things are. But like, again, this is someone's personal experience. So they're always going to be right. So Rachel, in all of these points, is 1 million percent correct because this is her experience and you can't be incorrect about your experience unless you're straight up lying you're not able to be incorrect about it it's your experience so you're always going to be right about your experience it's kind of stupid like in retrospect but at the time when i caught it like i was like oh come on um because what it is is like for me i don't struggle at the blank page i have never i'm in my 30s i've never struggled with it that doesn't mean i don't struggle i just struggle in a different spot so for a lot of writers, the blank page is terrifying. Like people talk about it all the time. And I remember being frustrated when I was younger because I didn't get it. I was like, what are people talking about? Why is a blank page scary? Because to me, a blank page was exciting because I have so many ideas stored in my head all the time. And um, I didn't really understand what I was experiencing until I talked to someone else who had a brain like mine. And we both talked about and tried to find an analogy that worked. And our best analogy we'd come to was seeing inspiration like a train at a train station. Right, so when you go to a train station, you need to either have a ticket or a train pass, right, in order to get on that train, to get through the gates, to get to the train. And the train itself is the inspiration. And for me and my creative friend, we found that for both of us, we always had train pass that seemed to always be valid. Like we could just scan at the gate, go right in and grab a train. So the inspiration itself wasn't a problem. We always had ideas like, seriously, I can form something. There were 27 people in the room but she knew none of them. The only person she didn't know, she had no intention of speaking to because screw him. Like I can, I can just start a story just by looking, like I looked at the lemons, which linked me back to like lemon wedges you would see in various drinks at a party, which linked me to a party with a bunch of people and a girl coming in, not knowing anybody except one person. And it's really awkward because she's in an argument with that person. Like I just started a story right here based on nothing but glancing down at my drink. Inspiration for me has never been the issue. The issue is I'm on the train and then I'm zoning out and I don't get off at my destination. That's my problem because I will be in the middle of a scene needing to complete that scene and then 10 other stories start inside my brain at the same time. I need to finish the scene, but I just, I just, I just started 10 different stories right now. I have too much inspiration and I know a lot of people will grow and like, that's a big problem. It's a big problem because it's hard to finish things. It's a big problem because I have too much inside my head bumping around. And for me personally, writing all of that down in a journal just means that that idea is going to die because once it's written, it dies. For me to use an idea, I have to take the idea and I have to use it when it's fresh or it dies, unfortunately. That's been my personal learned experience. This is definitely something that 100% works for her, which is wonderful. And I'm positive this works for other people because I know lots of people have commonplace books that are more than just random life notes. They're like inspiration notes. And if that works for you, 1 million percent go for it. Um, but for someone like me, I've noticed that I used to keep a, like a writing book with just random writing ideas. I don't anymore because I don't use them. So yeah, that was my first knee jerk. It's stupid because I intellectually I know better, but that I'm being transparent here. That was the first thing that I caught that my brain was like, no, that can't be true. And I'm like, caught that and thought about it. I was like, yes, it can. And yes, it is. There are tons of people that have this and experience this. And there's nothing wrong with you if you do. You are not a bad person. You are not a bad writer. Just because you need to charge your card. Like, especially because a lot of you guys can actually get off at your stop, unlike me. So. So you guys are doing great. This is not to say like there's there's no better problem for, for, than the other. They're all struggles. They're just different kinds of struggles. Both of our truths are true at the same time. You don't have to choose. You don't have to be either like a planner, prepper, designer, someone who knows exactly how everything's going to play out before they do it, or a completely seat of your pants, you know, improviser, um, no structure, no nothing. I, I just start things and see where they take me. You don't have to choose one of those. <laughs> if you want to improvise, if like me, you find it really motivating to not know how something's gonna end, to help get you to the end of it, 
you can do that. You just need to do structure studies first of whatever that is. But what I really want to hammer home here is studying something is not the same thing as doing a study of something. So in whatever way you can, make it an active process. Okay, so this is less of a knee jerk than the other ones, the least knee jerk, but I kind of wanted to add a little bit because I think Rachel is correct in like knowing how a story operates is important. However, I was noticing a few comments of people saying that they've had a hard time doing that in the past and that they'll try more with like practicing it like you would sketching and stuff. Um, but as someone who has done that myself and kept hitting a wall, um, the thing that really broke through that wall for me personally was just reading a ton and specifically active reading. Now, before I lose you entirely because you're having flashbacks to middle school and high school, I want to assure you right here and now, most schools do not teach active reading the way they should. In fact, most of them don't teach the concept at all. They just expect you to be able to do it, which is ridiculous because children should be taught how to do something before they're expected to just do it. But um, just like short stories, um, a lot of people are turned off of short stories because they're not actually taught how to short story. They're just told, give me a short story and we'll review it in class, which is ridiculous. Um, in the same way, people are just told to active read without knowing what it, it is. And a lot of people are also think that they're too stupid to do that, especially if you, instead of active reading, you use the term literary analysis. Of people, I'm looking at you, mom, because I know you watch my videos. Um, they say they're too stupid to do that, and I am here to say that you are not. Everyone is capable of doing it because literary means book, and analysis just means asking why to the point of being obnoxious. It's not deep. And to prove that, I'm actually going to take you with me to look at Hungry Hungry Caterpillar real quick. We're gonna active read it, and I'm gonna show you how easy it is. You can active read in a lot of different directions. You can like, what's your favorite character? Why do you like that character? Do you think this character is good or bad? Why do you think they're good? Um, would they still be good if the villain wasn't so bad? Like if I took away the villain, would you still think this person is a good person if the villain wasn't there? Those are great questions, but for Hungry Hungry Caterpillar, we're gonna dumb it down to, what is my favorite page on Hungry Hungry Caterpillar? What part makes me smile every single time I read it? And um, it's this page, this page right here. This page makes me smile. And why does it make me smile? Here's our why question. Well, uh, to understand that, well, what came right before the page? Well, it starts out really slow. Like there's the sun coming up, and there's a little egg on a leaf, and it's very cute. And th these are full sentences, right? It's a very leisurely start to the story, very slow. But when we get to this page, the page that makes me smile, we're speeding up. The sentences are now a lot shorter, faster. We have a list of items that the hungry caterpillar is eating because he's very hungry, you know. And just like a roller coaster, we know what's coming. We know the drop is coming, but right now we're on the clink, 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 clink up, right? And the anticipation is building. And at the very end of that list, we have a little awkward part where it was two sausages, which is kind of, you had to slow down to say it. All the others speed up quite quickly. These are said very quickly. When you get to that one, you slow down a wee bit. That's like the chunk chunk right before you go down. And now the caterpillar is sick. And um, so that's a very enjoyable part. Like it automatically makes you smile. You know what's coming up. It's not like what's coming up is a twist, but it's an exciting ride, right? You're here for the ride. So I just figured out what made me smile in a part of a book. I can take that and I can apply it to my sci-fi world. I have a fight scene and I want people really, really at the edge of their seat for that fight scene. I need to speed up. I need my sentences to be shorter, faster. And then right before my character gets stabbed in the gut, I need a sentence that's just a little longer and more awkward to read, just enough to like slow the reader, jolt them. And then the character gets stabbed. Uh, yes, uh, the editing me here, there is lost footage, um, don't worry about the red eyes, I'm, I'm fine, um, mental break. It, what I was talking about with, with story structure, how I kind of envision it is kind of like a manual for how to play Uno, the card game, except you have no cards and you've never seen the game played before. It's kind of hard to understand what the manual is talking about just reading it, right? Um, but if you had someone who was playing the game right in front of you, 
that's a different story, especially if you're getting involved in asking questions to that person who's playing Uno. Like, oh, what's this card do? Oh, it's a skip. Oh, that's what that manual is talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like, story structure is kind of like a manual. Manuals are great. They're fantastic. They tell you the official way things are done by the majority of people. Um, I mean, of course, there are house rules that everyone follows, but it gives you the general concept. So then you can, you know, make more house rules. Um, which is all right and good, but like you need to see that game played in front of you And that's why I'm talking about active reading so much and that's why I harp on it in that point um, Because I think there are some some a lot of people sadly in the writing community that have been harmed by education Because a lot of education at least in America is unfortunately kind of horrific um, and people are not taught um, things very well if at all and um, then they tend to think they can't do certain things and so when they get to something like story structure which is essentially instruction manual it looks and feels really complicated even though it's not it feels like it all this to say active reading I think is a really great basis um, and if you feel like you can't do active reading yes you can um, and if any of your teachers said that they are wrong <laughs> you are not stupid. You can do this. Um, everyone can do this. I believe that. Because if you're creating like there's no pot of gold, what the fuck is obligation doing in your creative practice? And I guess, who do you feel obligated to? I think it, there's a difference between feeling like you have an obligation to a project itself, right? You, you started something that feels worthwhile, like it should be finished, and feeling like you have a, a duty to to complete that collaboration. You have an, a, a duty to the work that you've already done to get to the finish line to be able to share that. If it's an obligation to other people, to an image of yourself that you're presenting to the world, that is not a good place to try and be creative from. For work that matters, follow electricity, not obligation. Okay, so... <laughs> Before I get into this one, I want to talk about context because context is king here at the crypt. Um, for context, earlier this year, Rachel came out with a video where she was talking about her creative process and like how she wasn't creating a novel anymore and why and like she went over her entire experience with creativity from childhood. This video was originally integrated within the original one, but it was way too long because both videos are massive, right? I think the first video was like 45 minutes long or something. This one's almost 54. So they're very, very long videos. Uh, so with that context in mind, this stuff, this information in this video was supposed to be alongside her life experience. In other words, these are rules she pulled out of her personal life experience. These rules were her personal rules to live by with her creativity, right? Through her experience. Personal being the key word here. Um, because I think it's really easy when you watch videos like this, especially if your ears just tune into a thing, like mine definitely did, and that's where my knee jerk came from. Because it came from the only work that matters is the kind, you know, that line. It's a very knee-jerky kind of line if you just tune in for that. Um, because I think for myself and for a lot of other people, especially those of us who are full-time employed, if you've been on my channel, you know that's like my biggest struggle. I'm a full-time employed teacher. I often do not have, I have the drive, I have the motivation. I do not have the time or physical capacity to sit down and write a lot of the time. I, I don't I have no energy left so if I don't make things an obligation a goal something that I have to do nothing gets done there was a period in my life where I wasn't writing for over five years I wrote nothing zero zilch nothing it was all so overwhelming I couldn't do it and that was one of the most depressing dark times of my life um, and like for me I have learned I need that North Star. I need those goals or nothing gets completed. And for me, I then feel just horrific at the end. Um, I think the idea of electricity is a really cool one. Like go where your, your passion goes. And yes, you should be passionate about what you're working with, absolutely. But I think there's something to be said as well for people who like me are working class and we're not able to have a job in creativity. We actually have to have a job in mediocrity and it's horrific for us and creativity is our only outlet but we don't have enough hours or time or ability to get into it as much as we like 
So we just have to scrounge up what we can, but we physically are so drained from our, our jobs throughout the week that by the time we can create, we're just physically exhausted. So then something that should be just simply passion and electricity becomes, I have to sit down and start this. And it's just, there's a draining aspect to that. Even though you want to, your soul wants to do it, but your body is weak. Um, and I think there's something to be said of like, where's the balance there? Like at what point do you're like, do you, cause like I tried to be like only follow electricity, but then I ended up doing nothing all the time because I had no obligations. So I didn't get anything done. And I am one of those people that need the goals to get started. But again, this is, you know, again, let's reframe this. Like this is her personal journey. And for her, this was really, really important key for her. And Rachel is 100% correct in this element of her journey because it's her journey, but that does not translate to everyone, of course. And um, it certainly doesn't translate to me, but that doesn't mean her truth is any less. And it doesn't mean my mine is any less. It just means we have vastly different experiences what was going on in my life and just my capacity at the time. But I think a big part of it as well was that I had created these expectations by sharing so much of it. And um, also by sharing the ideas I was having instead of the finished work, because it's very easy to share an idea and get that like nice dopamine reward hit of like people being like, oh, that sounds fun or that sounds cool. And then you have to do the difficult part, which is actually creating it and making it real. Why why do that when you've already gotten the dopamine hit of sharing the idea? So um, maybe don't share the idea, <laughs> Rachel. Maybe that's the way to go. What I've realized is that I need to have that boundary with myself to keep something in progress private because that is going to be the juice and the motivation and the drive that I need to actually finish it because okay so um this was one of the larger major reactions I had once again remember that context is seen from the last point that 100% comes in play and this point she does mention more frequently that like for her she'll like say things like for me um which I'm glad she does um, but it was another thing that like, I was very mentally against this initially. And at first I was like, why am I very mentally against this particular point? Like, why am I doing that? Um, <laughs> it's because the body doubling thing. Um, so I mentioned on my channel, um, before that I've been doing body doubling since I was very young. I didn't even know that was a word. Like I, I've been doing this weird thing since I was a kid and I didn't know there was a word for it or that it was even a thing. I used to like, if I had to do any task that was difficult to start because the starting of the task is the hard part. Once I actually start the task, I'm usually fine. Like cleaning, for example, starting cleaning is hard for me, but when I'm actually in the process of cleaning, usually I'll do the whole thing and it's fine. Um, but the start is really hard. Um, and also to keep myself from being distracted. What I would used to do as a kid is I would open my door, even though my parents weren't watching me. And most of the time I didn't tell them, like sometimes I'd announce I'm cleaning my room now, but most of the time I wouldn't, I would just have my door open and I would, it would, it would work. I would then just start working. I could do the thing. Um, sometimes if I need to do a bunch of financial stuff, I didn't want to, I would have to physically be around other people on my computer. And for some reason my brain would work and I could do the thing. Um, and years later, I found out when I was watching an autistic creator and she mentioned it as body doubling. I was like, oh, oh, that's a thing more people do. <laughs> um, pretty much what it is, is like having people along for the process of something aids me in starting when I need to start sessions of it. So for writing a novel, for example, having someone in the room, even if they're not actively like trying to hype me up or anything, it can still help. Um, now, of course, the idea of like, you could say, oh, well then just go to a coffee shop or something. You don't need to know about your project. Um, that doesn't work for me because coffee shops are too much. Too, they're, they're too loud. For me, once I noticed that body doubling was something I was doing a lot, I started utilizing on my channel. I would utilize things like live streams to my advantage to, like, this seems really selfish and it kind of is. I'm omitting to you guys that I'm like a little selfish on this one. Like I kind of use you guys to my advantage sometimes for live streams. I'm sorry. I hope I'm useful to you guys in the same way. That might not make it any better. I know there's a camera on. If I know there, even if there's no one in the room, I've had, I've had streaming where no one was in the room and I still was productive because the idea that someone could have perceived me worked. 
Now, do I think that I could pull it off with like consistently like having private live streams where for sure no one could happen in? I don't think my brain is gonna be tricked that easily. I think I do need to have the possibility where someone could actually watch me and perceive me. Um, which is very weird, but like it worked when I was a kid for me to clean my room and it works now for me to sit down even though I'm tired, even though my brain is scattered, it can help pull my brain together. I don't always need it. I don't need it every day, but every once in a while I do and having that benefit really, really works. Conscious of the fact that um, by doubling is something that works really great for me, might not work for Rachel and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just a personal thing of how our brains work. I'm gonna go ahead and close up here. Uh, like I said, uh, Rachel has 10 things she talks about. So if you're curious about anything more about this video, please see the link in my description box. See her original content. There's a lot of stuff on there. Um, I just wanted to walk you guys through how I actually apply what I preach on my channel and how when I have knee jerk reaction, like, no, no, that's not true. I, I can like, pull back and be like, wait, why do I think this isn't true? Because this is true. This is Rachel's personal experience. Of course it's true. I just have a different experience. And that seems like a no duh thing, but it's one thing to know something in like technicality, like intellectually know something versus actually actively doing it when you're consuming media, especially media on YouTube. If you like this, I've never done this kind of video before. If you guys like me walking through like this, um, a video like this, please let me know in the comment section below and I can see if I can do this with other stuff. Um, but honestly, this might have been just self-indulgent. For, that's okay. But, uh, but if you like this, please make sure you like the video. It really, really, really helps me a ton. And hit the subscribe button down below if you want to see more stuff. And again, let me know if you guys want to see more videos like this in the future because I can do that. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope you guys have a really great day. And uh, yeah, P.S. To all the people here at the crypt, if you go over to Rachel's video, be polite, be courteous as always. Just because we're dead doesn't mean we don't have manners, okay?